Well, um, hello everyone, and welcome to the Inclusive, Inclusive Spaces Seminar Series at the Butler, the Faculty of the Built Environment here at UCL. So I'm uh, Hanadi Samhan, and I'm an urban practitioner and a PhD candidate at the Development Planning Unit. I'm working on the uh, sacred ontologies of the volume of Palestinian camps in Lebanon, and um, I'm a tutor at the Botley School of Planning. And uh, and the uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, um, and I will be hosting uh, this inclusive uh, spaces session. Now, um, inclusive spaces is our monthly event, and led by the Bartlett Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion, what we call the EDI group. And um, where we explore disability, race, gender, LGBTQ+, and many other dimensions uh, of diversity and discover how they intersect uh, with the built environments around the world. Uh, today, you've joined the November edition of Inclusive Spaces, Religious uh, Infrastructure in the City. Now, uh, before I begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this session will be recorded as Alma just wrote and will be added to the YouTube channel uh, of the Bartlett, the Faculty of the Built Environment, and um, the Bartlett EDI website, and forwarded uh, to the uh, registered attendees. Uh, the format for today, um, I'm going first to welcome our guests to present uh, for the first half of the session, and uh, will be followed by Q&A uh, before ending promptly at two. Now, we encourage you to submit questions for the speakers at any point uh, during this lecture by clicking on the Q&A function, on the bottom of the screen, and you can also submit your own questions uh, or upvote uh, others. Um, I will start with my uh, my first speaker for today. Now, okay, um, um, sincere apologies for this uh, unfortunate event. Um, I'm going to introduce Saeed now. Saeed is actually he's a colleague of mine at the DPU at the Development Planning Unit, and uh, Saeed is working um, on uh, religious infrastructure in uh, in London. And the floor is, is yours, uh, Say Sayed. Okay. Thank you so much, Shani. Thank you. Let me sure. share my screen. Okay. Right. Thank you, Hanadi, for really good introductions. And I'm sorry for all the bit uh, glitch and Error during this webinar, uh, we, are, we are trying our best. And good afternoon to any one of you who join in from London, and probably good morning, evening, and salam alaikum to any brother and sister who watch it from all over the world. Uh, first of all, I need to thank you for the Bartlett Inclusive Space for this opportunity. It is such a great honor for me to be able to present my work progress and how it's intersectionality with the Islamophobia issues. And to avoid from positionality bias, uh, I would like to share my, personal, my positionality. I'm a Central Nation, raised and born there. I'm also uh, as South Asian Muslim, dominated by Sunni Muslim. I'm, I'm also raised and born as Sunni Muslim, living about two years in London for my PhD study. And I'm also a trained architect and urban planner. So to start the presentation, I would like to tell you about the story of this picture. If you can see from this picture, um, my research is about religious infrastructure of Muslim in London, study of productions of religious space, uh, supervised by Haim Yaqub in Kamna Fata. This mosque called Shepherd Bush Mosque because it's located in Shepherd Bush under Hammersmith and Fulham uh, Borough, London. Uh, what interesting about this image is three days before I took this picture, an imam announced a really important notice from neighbors couple that complained the noise produced from the Tarawih flood prayer. And on Saturday night, I took this picture and I saw many jama'ah or congregations coming out from the mosque and murmuring about the event they, that they witnessed. And one of my research participants approached me when I took this picture and he said like, this is ridiculous. The Imam asked jama'ah to lower their voice when reciting Amin or Amin if you like. Uh, due to neighbors complaint, but nobody does the same for the loud music that comes from that pub. I think every Jama'ah can hear the noise coming through the basement. Uh, they were bothered, but they cannot do anything. And he closed with his statement by, we never win to argue about it in this country. So 
So you, if you see this picture, you probably already have your perception or impression. If you could help me to do some quick survey, you can type in, in, in the chat box. What do you feel about it? How, when you see the pub and the moss uh, side by side standing in the same uh, place, uh, you probably have, normally people think how it's differentiated, how, how, what was different. You will say like halal or haram or develop, undevelop. It's, uh, probably religious or not really not religious secular or religious religious whatever you have in mind but to me i saw this as as a contact of super diverse community in london we, we, we could recognize the similarity in here which is denoted as a well-being space so the tension the contestation over space that temporality the, the, the temp and the temporality of it continuously negotiable and it will form in the end the standard of tolerance. Now look at the second picture here. You probably will see the, the family, a group of family will walk on a bicycle lane in front of the crowd of the mosque. This take the picture taken on Friday. And the, the, the family obstructed by the people who are coming out from the mosque and waiting for the queue for the second Juma. And the only they're only able to employ one uh, uh, security to control the crowd because, of course, there's financial reasons. And also, it's not the, the only problem or not the first problem that happened in this uh, mosque. A couple of years back, some Muslims even, even pray on the walkway. They just put the sajada right there or the praying man and start praying. And the Hamas bin and Proham Council start to um, policy it by putting the CCTV or surveillance camera to to, to, to avoid the Muslim praying on the same space again. And as you can see here, we learn about uh, what, said, uh, what, what it says by Lau, Laos and Lawrence that the most effective way to investigate the social construction of space is to analysis the contested space. In the sense, this, this space is contested between Muslim or non-Muslim or any other religious group. And the form of opposition, confrontation, subversion and resistance engage actor often with differential access to power and resource. So we can see that in separate booths, the form of tension not only experienced by both Muslim, but not only by Muslim, I mean, it's also by non-Muslim communities in this case, either Islam, Muslim, or how they practice the religious belief can be motive for the hate crime. Now, let's see the Islamophobia and the patterns uh, in London urban space. By definition, Islamophobia is rooted in racism and it's a type of racism that targeted expression of Muslimness or perceived Muslim. Related to the space, 71% of non-Muslim or the British citizen in general want to close monitoring of Muslim faith school. This probably have correlation with the uh, Trojan horse, a case in um, Birmingham, if not mistaken. And then the second is 43% concerned if a mosque was built near that. And uh, the third, there is uh, some of them believe that 23% believe that no go area actually are there where Muslim lives and dominate, domin, do, dominate the space. And if we see the pattern of Islamophobia, this is what Najib found, uh, you can focus on space, place, and urban model. Three of them are focused on where it, it, it happened, normally in part transport acts, in high public transit access public transport and public area or along major road or in everyday spaces and everyday places. And we see the geographical tension. We know that the Islamophobia not necessarily happened in Muslim population or where Muslim reside. It's more diffused rather than in the mosque also or in Muslim institution. And as a consequence, we will see that Muslim are worried about their mobility and their daily life. And the question is, so is there any place for Muslims in London to live and practice in accordance to their faith if you see this kind of pattern of Islamophobia? So we will see the, the, the answer probably within the community. So by preser preserving the community is also increase or maintaining their sense of belonging. This is echoes what Amin al in 2015, they found, her, her research found uh, that uh, there are five uh, reasons why Muslim seems like segregated. First, the structural inequalities, institutional racism, social economic marginalization, 
ingrained social cultural reason, staying with family and community, and hostility and discrimination against Muslim forced them to seek support from their own communities. So I highlighted the ingrained social cultural or probably religious cultural, just uh, they want to preserve the value and the knowledge of Islam close knit to the community. And on your right side, you will see probably Islam is not a monolithic uh, religion because based on the practice, they practice differently. And on, on the right side, yeah, your left side, you see the Wudi Bohra communities at Husaini Masjid, and then Ahmadiyya community at Baitul Futu Mosque, and also Sunni community, this uh, dominated uh, mosque London, in Islamic mosque, and then Shia community. So before we uh, go deep into the uh, details of uh, this community and Muslim demography, I would like to show you uh, if you want to study, if you want to study about religion, particularly in Western urban setting, probably we need to understand urban is as, as a territorial unit. So this is what uh, Mike Robert and Daniel said that they argue that logically that various way of religious organization impact their environment would be magnified by urban religious unit. Now, if you see the diagram on the right side, you will see London as a ter 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 religious territory, which is not only Muslim live there, there's some Jews, uh, Hindu, Christian, of course, and uh, Buddhist, Sikh, and any other re religion. And the, the, the district itself in here, I um, put an example, for instance, as a Muslim district. But you need to note that district itself is not like district of Hammersmith or district or of uh, uh, separate booths, for instance. It's more like metaphor that links social distance within, uh, within, the, uh, within the space. And then this uh, district connected each other, they help each other, uh, and the infrastructure is work as a connected, uh, that sharing the goods, people, capacity, idea that I will explain later in what is religious, religious infrastructure is. Now, let's go deep to the uh, demographic data of Muslim population. This data is uh, recorded in 2011. There are about two, 0.7 million of Muslim in England and Wales. And 40% of them, it's about 1.2 million, are resides in London. And the, the ethnicity dominated by still Asian and uh, Asian British, probably because of the, the, the colonial era. And then um, the age group, they are in really young age group, uh, still half of them uh, dominated by young age group and then nationality. They, they have like 70% of them we have British nationality and then 47.2% uh, Muslim born in UK. Let's keep about the housing. Now let's see the spread of the mosque in the central of the page in the slide. You see the distribution of 487, 80, 78 Muslim place for worship. This is, could include the actual mosque, higher hall, general a prayer room, musala, and etc. But my argument is this is not the only one that recorded. There's some mosques that not be, not, not been recorded yet because they don't have pr probably the, the, the permissions or it's not been registered. Now let's see how this mosque distributed based on the capacity. If you familiar with the central mosque or East London mosque, which is you can see by a really uh, obvious shape of the mosque with the dome and the minaret, that's only about 44, 45%, 45 number from all the total um, of 478. And the rest of it, people rely much on the everyday mosque. As you can see on the red side, that, that's all the mosque that spreads uh, all over the London. And the, the fact is, if you see the number of the capacity they can, they, they, they can hold, normally the the biggest mosque, they only held Jum'ah, for instance, only once, while the, the everyday mosque, they sometimes run twice, for instance, like Shepherd Booth Mosque, the capacity of 500 to 700 and run twice is probably will reach about 100 and 1,400. So this is really significant for Muslim, uh, no matter where they work or, or they live. Now we also see the mosque distribution based on Islamic faith. You will see that London is still dominated by the Sunni group, which is from Baladi school, the Ubandi, Maududi, or Salafi. They are spread uh, from East London to all West London. 
but this, the, the Shia group, you can see that it's a bit to the North London and spreading to the South London. And while the Sufi also still in the North London and the rest of it, uh, they have not uh, identified themselves as a uh, Islamic sect or probably uh, the data has been discovered yet. And then now we see the distribution based on uh, the, the ethnicity who manage the mosque. You see the central of Bangladeshi on East London, most of the mosque right there managed by the Bangladeshi and Pakistani pretty much spread. Arabs, as you can see from the Shia group, probably in not the, in Edgeware or North London, uh, North London, and also the Gujarati, uh, Turkey, which is if you go back to the Islamic side, you see a lot of Sufis here, and also the mixed group students, which is in the central of London, UCL, Westminster University, and so on, and other ethnic minorities such as Afghan or Bosnia Herzegovina, and then so on and so forth. So what is religious infrastructure in anyway? So religious infrastructure are built network that facilitate the flows of groups, people, or ideas and that allow the exchange over the space. And um, as a physical form, they shape nature of network that speed the directions of its movement, its temporalities, its vulnerabilities to break down. They comprise the architecture of circulation, literally providing sustainability of modern societies, they generate the ambience of um, environment of every life, large in 2030. But Jesunio, I like this definition that he made by act of living as a mode of collective existence and action to survive simultaneously in this sense, to survive religious life uh, amidst the condition of marginality. Now, what is uh, the object material of Islam that we can see? Uh, appears on space. Probably that you familiar with the mosque is only the second pillar, which is prayer. That's why we need a mosque, musala or prayer. But of course, as a religious infrastructure, we need to consider all of those infrastructure related to the five pillars of Islam that uh, as a material object, it's appear on space. For instance, like the profession for, of faith, Islamic center, educational institutional, military service, burial ground is important for Muslims to, to live in London. And fasting during Ramadan, we have a food shop and groceries, probably in the end of Ramadan, they will celebrate the Ain Fitri or Adhadi, Ad they use the religious equipment and apparel for them to shop. And then uh, the alm giving, we need the Islamic give, uh, alm giving institution or zakat institution and Sharia bank, as well as the pilgrimage travel agency and slaughterhouse for Kurban. Now, Shepherd Booths, I choose as uh, my ethnographic setting. This is denoted as a uh, religious corridor where we can see a lot of religion, not only Islam here. Um, we can see the, uh, the Sikh or the Christians with different type of Christian, different, sorry, different branch of Christians. Uh, and then if you can see here, it's all or this picture of an everyday mosque uh, that we can see around the area, which is um, pretty much sad if you see it, for instance, like the Mahmoud Mubatin Masjid is closed due to Imam pass away and other financial issues. And the next probably the Faisal Imam Shafi'i Mosque, they, uh, so they, 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 they had hardship in sustaining 300, 3,000 pounds of operational costs. And also, if you see the Darul Sunnah Mosque, which is located exactly behind the Shepherd Bush Market, where people throw rubbish, trash, it smells unpleasant, but to them, ability to perform is more important rather than the quality of location. And the Shepherd Booth Mosque also their own struggle, which is the capacity keep increasing because the mosque is closed, people keep coming. And every Jum'ah, there's a lot of tension and consistency we see around this place. So what is the preliminary research finding uh, that uh, I can note at, uh, until at the moment? So related to the first pillar of Islam, uh, of the profession of faith, there's an infrastructure of religious knowledge and values in, say, in, in form of educational uh, school or etc. But uh, I'm, I'm putting really interesting on this case where speaker corner, if you're familiar with speaker corner in Hyder Park where people can um, talk freely or in Oxford Street in other places sometimes in Soho too, the nature of freedom of speech in Western society may the, made the dialogue of religion in this space more casual and less intimidating. And, and you can see the same in Shepherd Bush Tube Station, where part of my release corridor, 
every weekend this space temporarily, this open space temporarily turned into a religious space where many religious institutions like Christian Coptic, Christian uh, and Pentecostal, uh, Muslim, and many more, they, they spread their what they believe uh, and, on, and what, what value on, on and they believe. Sometimes they also use a provocative uh, method uh, to bring the conversation. For instance, if you see on the picture like uh, Allah, uh, King of the King, or if you see on the top picture, Jesus is a Muslim, and you see the, 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 the gentleman here with the blue coat, looking at that text, probably he wants to approach and uh, discuss about that. That's probably one of strategy. And then um, what I found from the one of the, 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 the one who managed this um, Muslim booth said, as a Muslim, we live in Western country, country among the non-Muslim, we are suggested to the da'wah as written in the Quran. And then he continued by reciting Quran Surah Ali Imran, verse 104. And then this, this, the second uh, finding, uh, so far is about the zakat with, uh, of the, the obligatory charity which every Muslim need to uh, give them normally in, uh, in a year or when, when, when they reach a certain amount of it. And then the, the fact is Islamic really found 50% of Muslim UK household living in poverty and depression compared to 18% of general UK population. However, the tendency of zakat or fitrana in this case uh, from local giver distribute to the global Muslim community who are at war, in drought, or other hardship rather than to the local Muslim recipients. Mm. And the internal perception of Muslim within the institution said that Muslim in London are wealthy. Therefore, the charity is best distributed to other native countries. This is aligned when I uh, interviewed the Shabu Muslim management, when I asked uh, where, where are you going to distribute the zakat? And they said, um, uh, how do we allocate poor people here in London? Most Muslims are wealthy and stable compared to those in Pakistan, um, Syria, Bangladesh. Uh, if they want to receive zakat, they need to fill an application form to the mosque. Seems a bit hassle for for Muslim. Sometimes you see on the right side the uh, online uh, zakat institution. They also give a lot of advertisement about giving zakat or receiving zakat abroad rather than to the land, to the London community, to the Muslim London community itself. In the sense, we could understand that this, there are this connectivity between the local recipient or zakat institution in London. And the last, uh, we see the, uh, the pilgrimage related to the Hajj, but for the people who cannot do Hajj, they, they will do the korbani or the slaughter of animal. And I found from the, my, my, my ethnography field with some of my participants, one of my, my participants called Habiba said, my husband and I decide to do korbani in our home country. People in this country don't eat much meat compared to in our country. They don't need it. Many poor communities in our country need it more. And there is internal doubt by, by the perceived by the Muslim community regarding the proper Qurban ritual in the UK based on the theory that they believe, which school they believe. But uh, some of them, uh, they, they believe that the strict regulation uh, hold by the FSA or Food uh, Standard Agency on halal slaughterhouse, such as stunning, specific red meat temperature for transporting of our consumption and use waste cast out on proper kurbani in London or in UK in general. And then the slaughterhouse and halal butter tend to capitalize the urban and the, the kurbani, sorry, and making it unavoidable. A religious institution enable alternative for avoidable kurbani. Uh, from my survey, I found that when kurban comes, the price of uh, mutton or lamb not, that normally costs around 100 pound during the Qurban, it's twice, like 200 or 270 maximum. While if it hold by religious institution, the price is the same. Uh, there's one mosque that I found in, in uh, Peckham Mosque, Peckham Islamic Center, if I'm mistaken, they, they, they hold the same price as, not reason, as everyday uh, price. And then there are contestation of most proper ritual for Qurban among the halal butcher and the slaughterhouse. So if you, if you, if you buy the, uh, the Qurban, if you want to, apply for Kurban, I mean, they will say, oh, we are the most uh, proper one. That's why the price is expensive. Is that what they, they always advertise? Well, uh, so far, this is what I can uh, present uh, the progress of my research. Thank you for the floor, and I give it back the floor to you, Hanadi. Thank you. Sayed, we have questions uh, for you and from the attendees. And um, I don't, I'm not sure if you can see the questions, or do you want me to, to state them so that we can have a discussion about them? 
Mm. Yeah, I think uh, let me see the first question from Kian. Sorry, yeah. Uh, mm, it's about how do religious in practice religious institution enable alternative for affordable korban? I think I just answered this question first. Uh, it's basically because of not religious uh, religious institution not allowed to do the korban. Only specific people who are in abattoir or in slaughterhouse allowed to do the korban, which is just based on the. Uh, the FSA regulations about the slaughterhouse. So probably it's my assumption, the most that I said can do uh, Kurban the same price as the norm is everyday space. They are also work in, 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 in slaughterhouse probably, but I need, I need to figure, I need to dig that deep um, in the future, but uh, optimistically you can say that religious infrastructure works as a medium to create affordable uh, Kurban. Okay, um, I will read the second question for you. Okay, yes. it's from uh, from Kira or Kaira. So, mm -hmm. do you think cities and towns should be divided into districts according to religion to avoid conflicts such as the, such as the noisy pub disturb disrupting the mosques, as you mentioned at the start? Would this accentuate the divide between religions and races when we have focused on being more inclusive and appreciative of each other's culture this decade? Or would this create more harmony between religions, as there would be not to be any clashes in daily activity? It's a long right. one. <laughs> this is really good interesting questions. Yeah. Yes, yes. When when we talk about uh, cohesiveness or or sense of uh, uh, collective life, for instance, uh, I, I probably I don't have a specific answer about it. But my pessimistic uh, my pessimistic nature, I believe that. Do you think urban is already segregated based on like capitalistic nature? Rich people get it in their own house or their own community. But the thing is, we all live as assemblage, like 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 a music in an orchestra. We live to support each other, but we need to build a standard of tolerance. That's why, uh, probably, no, no no matter how we are divided based on religion or based on money or financials um, that we have as a as an urban um, citizen. We still need to live each other, particularly in, in multi multi uh, cultural society. Like, it's for, for instance, like in, in London, I don't have precise answer about uh, do we need to build cohesiveness or or sense of uh, living together, because in fact we are segre segregated already. What we have to build now is how to understand each other, and then how we build a sense or standard of tolerance. I hope to answer your questions. There's really good questions in it. It is. I mean, um, if I'm, I'm really happy to take further questions from the attendees, if anyone would like to to ask a direct question or just write it down. Um, if not, I would like to take this this question further and 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 discuss with you. Um, say it is that, I mean. The way you presented um, the religious practices is basically to present it through the the, um, the way of life, right? Is that Islam is not just you know a religion that is bounded, you know, it's 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 actually directs us how to navigate the city, how where to go in terms of food, you know, or whatever we want to do. So you know, to live in isolation and in separate dis districts for me, it's a bit you know, it's a bit uh, delusional. Because at some point we will have to interact and to intersect with each other, and this is what you said basically that we have to be more tolerant and more um, and more uh, forward in our thinking. Right, right. So, yeah, I agree. I agree with you, Hannah. Yeah, uh, that that's why it says by I Amin mean, Hart that uh, it seems segregated, but in fact uh, there, are, if you see, there are five items, which is uh, one of five, four of them, I assume, is something like. Uh, external factor that Muslim cannot control, such as segregation in institutional, in workplace, in, in any, you know. But what Muslim as a community can control is how to keep their son, for instance, or their, their generations still within the value of Islam, the teaching Quran. That's why some of them still believe in living in Muslim community where they can found Islam education nearby their house. It's important to live in a in, in secular country. For, for, for me, I think the, 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 the conflict between religion in London probably uh, less issue currently. It's more pro, uh, between the, the, the non-believer and the believer. That's why the, the, the corridor, this, the religious corridor provides an alternative space where all religion can live 
each other without any specific ethnic uh, dominance dominations that's probably what future of London, a future of super diverse country, super diverse um, community. And it's also doesn't mean, it also doesn't, uh, you know, avoid the idea that probably in the future, there are a building that have different religion in one of building that can interact each other and pray, you know, with different room, for instance, but still. So labeling is an issue. <laughs> to put labels on things. Um, so now I have I have two other questions. Uh, I have a question from Moaz, and he's uh, he's asking: uh, Does the incoherent inside the Muslim community make it harder to explore solutions and concepts for their needs? Well, that's uh, is that question for me. Yes, that's a question right. for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a tough one right. for you. Okay, um, I think. Uh, let me digest this. Does the, does the coherent inside the Muslim community make it harder to expose solution and concept of what they need? I, that's, I think, uh, what I would say is if you are living in a close-knit uh, community, probably the infrastructure is just come right to you. I mean, the, the, the proximity with you and the religious infrastructure is closer, so the solution is always there. But the thing is, imagine if I live like in South London or, or, or in any other place in London except for London, Manchester, or Birmingham, which I, I would difficultly find mosque or any other halal food vendor, for instance, it's gonna be a lot of trouble for me, of course. That's why even uh, as a migrant or Muslim who come in uh, come first to London, the first thing that they find probably the closest space, the closest place to, to gain food or grocery, the halal, actually, if it answer the question. Okay. Um so basically, I have another question. I will, I will I will state it now, but I can go back to the to the answer about you know difference in Muslim communities. So, uh, Olia or Olia is asking. I'm really curious about your positionality. This is an interesting one. How did you build the trust to your participants? Right. This is the, the exactly really interesting question about positionality because I I also say earlier that I'm Sunni Muslim, uh, more, like most of association Muslim normally. Uh, the thing is, uh, my, my, the case in, in, in my corridor, my setting of ethnography, all of them normally Muslim, uh, Sunni Muslim, but also uh, in uh, the, the, the Sunni, the, not the Sunni, but the Salafi. Yeah, some, some Salafi mosques right there. But I think as long as Sunni, I can go pray and, you know, access all the building. But the thing is, let's say uh, to the Shia or the Sufi, which is, I don't know how to practice the way they do, uh, it's a bit uh, difficult for me to gain access to them or to interview them because you know the conflict between internal religious also there. Um, you know that, there's no personality really important. Of course, uh, I'm, I cannot access all the religious facilities at the moment in, in London. But to my corridor, my my ethnographic corridor, yes, I think as Muslim, I'm internal somehow, but I'm also external or outsider because I'm not Londoners. I don't have any London citizen. I live here only two years, something like that. And I'm also a researcher, that's also part of personality. I have intention, you know, I have purpose on it. I'm not doing that, like, you know, not like a normal citizen of London. Interact because they need to interact. I interact to them because uh, my research. Yeah, I need to note that on my writing probably. Okay, great. Um, Ala, would you like to, would you like to just, you know, comment, give us like a feedback or contribute? I mean, I just want to apologize for this. I think the network in my area is not now. I'm on my own internet, but um, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry, uh, but I just wanted to make a comment on what Saeed said about access to communities. Um, uh, you know, like any other, I don't think there's anything kind of exceptional about access to Muslim spaces and other than building trust and friendships and um, other spaces. Yes, there are different, um, in, you know, there are different religious groups. There's a lot of rich diversity between, uh, you know, where there are 1.2 million Muslims in London. So there's a rich ethnic and uh, sectarian diversity within uh, the Muslim community. Um, but access is is possible, and I think. Um, it just it just needs a bit of effort from the researchers need to make an effort. 
both to kind of break down the barriers between the different religious groups, but also to build trust and to um, give the different uh, insights into the rich diversity of the cultures that exist within the different uh, mosque spaces and different religious spaces. There is a lot of variation. I, I kind of am enamored every time I get to a new space, how they run things differently. Uh, the events that they hold are differently, the kind of um, particularly of, I, I think, of direct interest within Muslim groups is this kind of intergenerational relationships to religious spaces. So like, how do you cater for different religious needs? How do you bring the next generation on board to take over charities, to take over the governance of these mosque spaces is a particularly interesting one. I was going to touch on that in my talk, um, but I couldn't, unfortunately. I really apologize about that. No worries. Thank you, Allah. Okay, I have three questions. Um, uh, okay, and you know, feel free both, I mean, if you want to respond. So uh, the first one is from Farah, and she's asking, do any, I mean, it's, this is probably for Said. do any of your participants retain their country of origins identity when constructing infrastructure? Yes, that's also a really good uh, question indeed. Uh, yes, uh, I believe uh, many British citizens, they have like multiple identities. They cannot distinguish between what should I go first? I am British, I am Muslim first, or I am like, let's say Indonesian, for instance, and I'm British, if I have British citizen. In my case, my friend, uh, uh, my, my, my participant, sorry, he's uh, Pakistani, he's also Muslim, he's also British. Uh, so it's a bit difficult, but they, they need, they need to hold that for their, their basic identity. So if you want to grade them, if you want to list them, they're gonna put like Muslim first and a Pakistani and British the last. Yeah, that's, that's based on my empirical study. Okay, I, I, there's a question here, interesting one. Um, it's a comparative one. So Saif is asking, many churches in the UK are not being used in the same ways as in the past. Do you think more needs to be done to accommodate interfaith dialogues with Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, and Buddhists? Um, I'm not quite understand about the interfaith dialogue uh, in that space. Probably, if if you refer to, is it possible for the like the unused mosque or unused um, uh, temple to be changed into other religious group uh, place for worship? That's happened a lot. New Peckham Mosque was built on a church, or there is some uh, also synagogue in North London uh, has been built for Ahmadiyya sectarian group. Yeah, I think that's that's also implicitly say that there is a dialogue between the, the religious group. Of course, even though the, the the church is not being used by that uh, community anymore, but still holds or still owned by the the, the, the Christian community or the, the Jewish community. But because of that dialogue, that that beautifully mingle around London as a tolerance of tolerance country of every religion, that's why they can build the the mosque inside the church. It's never happened in Indonesia probably or or in our I don't know. Yeah. In case in Indonesia it's a bit difficult something happened like that. Thank you. I just want to add to that. Yeah. Go ahead, I just wanted to add to that point, um, which is unfortunate that I keep I, wanting to share my examples because the two designs of the mosques that I wanted to share was one that was exactly that was the one in Harrow that's going to be open to uh, other cultural groups. And that was one of the kind of pro conditionalities of the planning proposal. And it's on the high street. So it's about the design of these new spaces to actually offer public services, you know, restaurants, gymnasiums bringing that culture outwards and that in, intercultural engagement um, as part of the design of the mosque. Um, whereas the example of the second mosque that I was going to show was, was the idea of, no, we need to kind of ensure the needs of our own growing community uh, intergenerationally from elderly care homes to facilities for child care that the state is no longer providing. And, you know, using kind of membership um, uh, models of of governance um, and almost like a large social co-op some of these new mosques are being run in in, in kind of new ways um, to ensure these services and what really struck me was a story where, you know my friend um, got killed cycling her bike in Holborn a few months ago and I only realized the value of kind of I have realized the value of being a member of a community it was when I, when I saw our community take our body wash and you know i realized well you know this is the community that will look after us when we are aging when we die and so on and then i realized what why being part of a religious group in a community is so important and and who does that labor who does that work 
right? And so these these mosques serve really critical social functions for our, for our for, for people. And the more we some people realize, the more they can extend that outwards is another form of da'wah that it's not just about us. And, and, and this is where the, 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 the transition from the first generation of Muslims that came to this country, you know, in the 60s and 70s is now transitioning to the second generation and those questions are being asked and they're being staked. You know, who are these mosques for? Um, some communities remain small, some communities have expanded and that reflects in the design of some of these new mosques as service providers. Well, thank you. Um, I have I have two questions, but there's one for you. I will skip, okay? There's one before that, but I'll go directly to this question. Um, so this is sorry. It's for Allah. It's unfortunate that we couldn't see the whole presentation, but as far as I could understand, the design and the four mosques were to be discussed. I'm interested in the gender segregation and inclusivity in mosques. I'm wondering if the new approaches and designs ever add something to the traditional use of space between genders in the scope of your research? And thank you. I mean, we, me and Hanadi discussed this um, because it, it featured in one of the mosques, we called it the English mosque, right? The Cambridge mosque. And, um, and you know, these the, the design of these, all of these new mosques have spaces for women, have sometimes equal spaces. So there's a flexibility of the space. Um, it's not like hard walls or separate rooms. Like it's, it's there's, you know, it's a balance between the intermingling that happens between sexes, but also the space and the safe space that you need for, you know, for, for, for mothers with children who want to feed versus, you know, kind of privacy issues and, um, the desire. I mean, you know, we all know that the Grand Mosque in Mecca is is not segregated, right? Mm -hmm. So this is more um, uh, the the idea of segregation reflects a you know a, a patriarchal um, a patriarchal conception of the role of women and others, in which that is being challenged in the design of some of these new mosques. Okay, I have two questions, and uh, then we need to wrap up. Okay, so one from Ayan. Uh, Ayan is asking, so do you think more open-minded interaction between inter internal sex would help internal sex would help build trust and communication with the external environment? And what would that help break down the walls between Muslims and other religious groups? Is that for me or for Allah? I mean, you feel free to answer if you want. I mean, Allah. You want to answer that, Allah. I, I, I'll answer it just because um, I am a Shia Muslim and uh, say it is Sunni and Sunni, it kind of bothers me that actually, you know, mainstream Sunni Islam is the normative uh, Islam, it's a dominant sect. And when you are from a minority sect, you know, you have a sense of um, yeah, our spaces can be insular as a minority within, the, within a dominant group. Uh, at the same time, there is, interfaith work happening and they need to happen um uh, more i agree and uh, and they for example in one of the harrow the harrow mosque that i was going to show um they will host uh, the local sunni community for friday prayers uh because there's another shia mosque not far away they can't have so that kind of the congregations around sect and who can use the space needs to be constantly negotiated and um so you know it's it's good to see i mean unfortunately it's not even between intersect that sometimes within the sects themselves you know we have a pakistani mosque a, a mosque for palestinians and you know community centers for for um north africans and others you know there is there are some mixing on the margins but predominantly Sometimes these mosques are shaped around different ethnic ethnic groups. Some mosques are shaped around different um, generational groups, and and so on. So there is a diversity there, but it, it's 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 being I think negotiated at the moment as the elder generation. Who maybe someone asked about whether some mosques reflect where people origin, you know, that where from the kind of the the country of origin. Um, and yeah, I mean, I find that, you know, in Ramadan, for example, we've always had the, a culture in my family where we will try and visit as many mosques as possible during Ramadan because we celebrate Ramadan differently in this country. Ramadan in this country is celebrated predominantly around the mosque in ways that it isn't necessarily 
you know, we break our fast in the mosque in the way, you know, I'm originally from uh, the island of Bahrain and we don't, you know, we break the fast at home. So we make the point of visiting all the different uh, mosques, you know, Iraqi, Syrian, uh, Afghanistani, Af Af Afghani and um, Persian and others, because we get that different cultural vibes everywhere we go and we like that. But yeah, there's a kind of sense that some mosques are kind of, um, uh, people congregate around their ethnicity even within the sect. So there's lots of layers of, uh, you know, lots of boundaries within sex and between sex and others that exist. Um, but yeah, it, it's it kind of, you know, and that's sometimes the nature of the city and the nature of geography, but other times it's not, it's a conscious decision. Right. Probably I would just add a bit about the boundary. Probably they have like uh, the, the tolerance between what is ritual and what is ceremonial, you know. So some Muslim like they want to push to far to the ritual part, but for the ceremonial, probably yes. For instance, like when when the the, the Shia group doing uh, uh, the Ashura, they do the the, the march. I also uh, join in, you know, as part of I want to learn to talk to them to to feel how how does it feel in the crowd and you know. Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, just uh, I'm, I'm going to take the last question, and it has to be fast because I need to wrap up and to finish the session. Okay. So the last question is from Michael, and I think it's for you, Sayed. He's asking, mm -hmm. uh, what made you decide to design slash build religious um, infrastructure in the first place, or what was your motivation? I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Right. Probably uh, the question is uh, not uh, what I'm designing or what I'm building because the religious infrastructure itself is basically like a network of cable or, or pipe or roads which is connecting all the good people capacity around England, UK or London in general. So I'm not building anything here, but I want to investigate that religious infrastructure, which is like a pipe, which pipe is broken, which is want to fill that gap. And if you want to see which halal food or which, which, which kurbani that have a problem of the ritual, which they, they know as proper kurbani, so we can see whether or not the religious infrastructure or religious institution can help those infrastructure fill the gap of the proper one, which is a lot of people like to doubt about that. Uh, yeah, in my setting, anyway. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, thank you for the questions. I, I just want to wrap up and just to give some reminders. So we explored the meaning of the social practice, uh, you know, of Islam by looking at interconnections between public spaces, personal faith, between religious lift space and religious ecology and what enables the production and inclusion of religious life and infrastructure and infrastructure of cities. So thank you everyone for joining and I'm so, so sorry a lot that you couldn't share your presentation. I mean, unfortunately, and um, your thoughts side are very provoking. So um, I, I urge everyone to join us uh, for the inclusive spaces uh, that is gonna be back on Wednesday, 14th of December. Uh, with disability inclusive design for climate resilient cities and with colleagues from UCL led global disability innovation uh, hub. Um, so sign up, uh, details are in the chat. So we hope to see uh, everyone there. And uh, I just want to say, uh, have, a, have, have a lovely afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.